Now, the first philosophical question is about time. The second philosophical question is about existence. And the third one is about you. Now, the hardest part, contrary to popular belief, the hardest part of doing philosophy is not answering the questions, it's understanding the questions. It's understanding the questions. Because here's the ship, you see, and it leaves behind it a wake. It is always now. Where the future and the past come together, it seems to me there isn't anything there. There is no now, really. Uh, we, it may seem very philosophical, but it seems like we don't exist. Uh, you know, how could we exist? There's no now to exist. In. The past and the future come right together. Where, where is that place in between? How long is it? <laughs> <laughs> there are two answers to that question. This is a real fun question. I love it. What people mean by positive psychology just doesn't capture this, this you know, far end of you know, several sigmas beyond the norm uh, in terms of what people experience. So, now, if you are sufficiently perceptive, you can notice that it's always now. I mean, uh, members of the public who are not trained in philosophy are actually much better at spotting or oh, having these insights than people who've been trained in philosophy. Uh, faculties. Uh, I just, I, I'm rolling the dice with spirituality knowing that I, it's going to produce a fair amount of pain. Uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, I, there is just, there's no better word in English. The mm -hmm. point is that um, presence is the presence of God. Presence is the presence of God. If we understand the unchanging nature of now, the nowness of now, if we understand that thoroughly, we'll realize that it has the attributes of God. It's, it's immaterial, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, timeless, it's a necessary condition for everything that happens in time, and so on. The question is about now. He's saying, really, there is no now. There is the future and the past come together, and the future turns into the past, and it goes, and it's gone like that. The, the, the point is that um, there's a sense in which now is timeless. There's a sense in which it's always uh, now, where this always doesn't really pick out duration or a moment or even something that's instantaneous, but um, something that's utterly uh, changeless. And, and we spend most of our lives forgetting this truth, repudiating it, fleeing it, overlooking it. And, and the, the horror is that we succeed. So, you know, in no time at all, the future has become past. And so we get this frantic feeling, where, would it, where did it go? <laughs> we, we manage to never really connect with the present moment and find fulfillment there because we are, we are continually hoping to become happy in the future. And the future never arrives. The more interesting question is, why is it now? Well. Let's take the small view, first of all. The now is infinitely short, and yet it's the only thing that is. I think that is a philosophically significant question. In that case, this whole world is an illusion. This is because as you go back in time, you reach a point at which, in Hoyle's words, the universe was shrunk down to nothing at all. It doesn't really exist. When uh, the king, the emperor Akbar, once was feeling a little sorry for himself and uh, asked his jeweler, he said, make me a ring that will restrain me in prosperity. Now, even when we think we're in the present moment, we're, we're in very subtle ways always looking over its shoulder, anticipating what's coming next. And support me in adversity. Now, most of us do our best not to think about death, but, but the, there's always part of our minds that knows this can't go on forever. We, we, the, part of us always knows that we're just a doctor's visit away or a, a phone call away from being starkly reminded with, with the fact of our own mortality. And so the jeweler made him a ring and gave it to the emperor and he saw written on it, it will pass. Now the other side of the matter is this, that this short now is an illusion of the clock. We make our second marks on clocks as thin as is consistent with visibility. And therefore, we always think of the present as crossing the hairline. That's too long, see? We're always solving a problem. And it's possible to simply drop your problem, if only for a moment, and enjoy whatever is true of your life in the present. How short can you get? <laughs> see? <laughs> 
Well, really, the present isn't like that at all. I mean, everything is going to go... Right. <laughs> this is not a matter of new information or more information. It, it, it requires a change in attitude. It, it, it requires a change in, in, in the attentiveness you pay to, the, to your experience in the present moment. There is nowhere else but now. Everything that happens is happening now. Because what happens now, just as the sound comes out of silence, all this comes out of nowhere. Thus, what the Big Bang model requires is that the universe began to exist, all life suddenly emerges out of space and was created out of nothing. Bang, right now. Okay, that, that, why is it now, now? It has to be now, now. That's a trivial question. Well, it's like your field of vision. Your field of vision isn't just a point of light. Your field of vision is an oval. And uh, at the, it isn't fuzzy at the edges. It just ceases to be at the edges. But there's plenty of room in it to see something move across. So in your field of time, your now, there is enough now to include a phrase of music. If there weren't, uh, you wouldn't be able to make out melodies because there'd just be instantaneous notes with no connection between them. You would never hear intervals. So now is a big slobby thing. <laughs> but it comes out of nothing. And the wake fades out and that tells us where the ship has been in just the same way as the past and our memory of the past tells us what we have done. Now, it seems to me that that question is trivial. Best mileage you can go toward answering that is that there was a beginning at to time. But as we go back into the past, and we go back and back to prehistory, and we use all kinds of instruments and scientific methods for detecting what happened. That there was a beginning to the universe. We eventually reach a point where all record of the past fades away in just the same way as the wake of the ship. A proponent of the Big Bang Theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. But that's a pretty hard pill to swallow. Otherwise, it becomes inexplicable why, out of all the infinite moments of past time, it's now. And to ask again, why does it happen, is an unprofitable question. Because the interesting thing is not why, but what. What happens, not why does it happen. Thoughts simply appear in consciousness. They appear in consciousness. Very much like my words. Very much like my words. Maybe, what, what are you going to think Maybe, next? What, what are you going to think next? Because the interesting thing is not why, but what. I think that is a philosophically significant question. So why does the universe exist instead of just nothing? What happens, not why does it happen. Where did it come from? There must have been a cause. Everybody assumes that it is basic, that there's such a thing as cause and effect. Because actually, what we call a cause and what we call an effect are two ways of looking at one and the same event. Which brought the universe into being. So let us suppose, the sun shines and shines and shines so that there is no rain. And we say, as the result of there being no rain, there is a drought. From the very nature of the case, this cause must be an uncaused, changeless, timeless, and immaterial being which created the universe. Second question, what is uh, being? There's a distinction between being and beings. I mean, by beings, I mean the Sheldonian theater, your head, uh, the Bodleian library, this ballpoint pen, um, examination scripts to Martin. These, these are beings or things that are. But by being, I don't, by being or uh, being as being, I don't mean another thing like that. I mean the existing that all this is doing or what it is for any of this to be. He thus points to exactly what the Christian has always believed, that in the beginning, God created the universe. Or the being of what is, whatever is. Now, if you understand Heidegger, or if you don't like Heidegger, if you read Parmenides, you can start at the beginning of philosophy instead of at the end, if you like, if you, read, if you understand Parmenides. Now, I put it to you, which is more plausible? You'll begin to understand that the properties of being 
thoroughly understood are the properties of uh, God. Being is largely ineffable, necessary for uh, beings. It's infinite, it's immaterial, and so on. And as the result of there being a drought, there is no water to drink, the plants do not grow, and people and animals starve, and that is the consequence of the drought and of there being no rain. Well, all that is nonsense, because the lack of rain, the lack of water, and the starvation are simply all the same event, only they are separated into parts for purposes of description. Perpetual sunshine, no rain, drought, lack of water, lack of food, starvation. These are all names for different aspects of one and the same event. It's all of a piece. I can say, well, I am doing this now because I did that then. And so I am producing for you a continuous line of thought. Only when we separate that event into different parts and have forgotten that we did that in the first place. Because that gives other people the impression that we're saying. It must be personal as well. Why? because this cause must be beyond space and time. Therefore, it cannot be physical or material. Then we have to explain how they're connected. Now, there are only two kinds of things that fit that description. Either abstract objects, like numbers, or else an intelligent mind. And so we invent a mythological deity called causality in order to connect them together. But abstract objects can't cause anything. There's nothing of the kind. It's all one event. So I think this is one more reason to think the past is finite. Supposing we say, well, uh, I am the result of the fact that my father went to bed with my mother. That is rid ridiculous nonsense. You are the same as that. If you ask me then, why am I talking? Well, I could say I'm making a living this way. Or I have a message that I want to get across to you. But that's not the reason. You're not the result of it. That introduces an element into thinking which is completely unnecessary. I'm talking for the same reason that birds sing and for the same reason that the stars shine. Is I, I, I dig it. A man fertilizing a woman is a child. It's all one process. Why do you dig it? And then if you think it back the other way, you cannot blame your father and mother for having produced you, since you are one event with their having done so. You were their lust for each other. Fascinating, when you think of it like that. Because you also contain that lust, and so you should be able to understand them and absolve them for any responsibility for having brought you into this world. You can't say, I didn't want to be born, if you yourself have sexual lust. Well, I could go on answering all sorts of questions about human motivation and psychology, but they wouldn't explain a thing, because explaining things by the past is really a refusal to explain them at all. He says, but don't we have examples of actual infinites in the, the uh, spatial continuum? The whole idea of there being only space and nothing else at all is not only inconceivable, but perfectly meaningless. I would say no, there's no reason whatsoever to think that space is really continuous. Mandelbrot gave them the name fractals. Fractal patterns seem so familiar because these shapes are omnipresent in nature. The branching patterns of trees follow this principle, as do the courses of rivers. Lightning spreads into smaller and smaller branches, each sharing the same features as the main bolt. Because we always know what we mean by contrasts. We know what we mean by white in comparison with black. They must come into being together. Because of the inseparability. It can be modeled as continuous mathematically, but there's no grounds for thinking that space really is. Uh, continuous in the way described. Because of the inseparability of these opposites, they always go together. This, as it were, hints at some kind of unity which underlies them. I would agree with Aristotle that a, a, a line or a distance is logically prior 
to any subdivisions that we make on the line. You don't have first something, then nothing, or first nothing, and then something. This unity is called Tao. Space and form, in that sense, go together as the fundamental things we're dealing with in this universe. That which is void is precisely form, and that which is form is precisely void. So that this is merely an infinity in potentiality, not an actuality. By contrast, an infinite past would be an infinite series of actual events of similar duration piling up without beginning, and then it really does occasion all sorts of interesting problems. I'm now it's amazing what doesn't exist in the real world. In the real world, there aren't any things, nor are there any events. That doesn't mean to say that the real world is a perfectly featureless blank. Uh, and the third philosophical question is, why is something you? Now, um, this is again a hard question to understand because we think we already have the answer. We think the answer lies in biology, physics, chemistry, evolution, so on. Now, I, I don't want to deny any of those very well-known facts of science. Let's suppose they're all true, even though because science has a history, it's very unlikely that it can be true. <laughs> now, uh, once all those facts are in about you, you were born in such and such a place, you've got such and such a mind, you have such and such a mother, such and such a father, and so on. We've not begun to understand why you view the world from this human being. What does explain things is the present. Why this moment? Why, why 2011 is now? So I think this is one more reason to think the past is finite. Why do you do it now? And the knowledge is of the nature of acquaintance or experience. The, these events happening now have, have un, un, unrolled or are unrolding. Now, this is as far as the universe has got. But this is a comparatively superficial answer for many reasons. This is a slight cheat because that doesn't explain it either. In, intuitively or centrally, uh, this is a superficial answer because, in a sense, it's always now, or it's never not now. The future is always in the past. Uh, and the future is always in the, in the future, and the past is always in the past. Uh, well, maybe the future is in the past as well, but we, <laughs> we have to keep it, um, keep it sim sim simply. It, it's certainly true that uh, any present is uh, somebody else's future and somebody else's past. I mean, we're, we're in some people's future and we're in some people's past, but never mind about that. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the... Because what happens now, just as the sound comes out of silence, all this comes out of nowhere. Out of nothing, nothing comes. This is in connection with what I explained to you in another talk about the power of nothingness. It's not of uh, centrally or paradigmatically of a propositional nature. All life suddenly emerges out of space. Bang! Right now. Okay. Only when we separate that event into different parts and have forgotten that we did that in the first place. Out of nothing, nothing comes. Some intrepid atheists have asserted that the universe just popped into being without a cause. But surely that's metaphysically impossible. Then we have to explain how they're connected. And so we invent a mythological deity called causality in order to connect them together. There are very few people, even I would say teaching philosophy professionally in the West, who understand philosophical questions in their profundity. Western philosophy has been grounded on the idea ex nihilo nihil fit. Nothing is nothing is nothing is nothing forever. For such a conclusion is, in the words of philosopher of science, Baron of Konigscheider, in head on collision with the most successful ontological commitment in the history of science, namely the metaphysical principle that out of nothing, nothing comes. So why does the universe exist instead of just nothing? Where did it come from? There must have been a transcendent cause which brought the universe into being. And it comes up as a kind of terror of nothing, a put down on nothing, on everything to do with nothing, everything associated with nothing, such as sleep, passivity, rest. 
What has struck me is that nothing, the negative, the empty, is exceedingly powerful. Nothing is more fertile than emptiness. Because whenever a physicist talks about the nature of the world, there may be an infinite number of universes, and in each universe uh, that's been created, the laws of physics are different. It's completely random. He describes a, a form, he describes a process, which can be put into the shape of a mathematical equation. No. You don't have to invent mystical creatures. No, I don't think you do. I just think you have to say you don't know and keep on trying to find out, and maybe we'll never find out. And so if you say A plus B equals B plus A, everybody knows exactly what you mean. It's a perfectly clear statement. But nobody needs to ask, what do you mean by A or what do you mean by B? Or if you say one plus two equals three, that's perfectly clear. But you don't need to know one what, two what, or three what. And all our descriptions of the physical world have the nature of these formulae, numbers. They are simply mathematical patterns, because what we're talking about is pattern. But it's pattern of such a high degree of complexity that it's very difficult to deal with it by thinking. In science, uh, we really work in two different ends of the spectrum of reality. We can deal with problems in which there are very few variables. Or we can deal with problems in which there are almost infinitely many variables. You have to see that our being sucked by all sorts of stimuli is exactly the same thing as our apparently voluntary and deliberate action. Because what we're looking at is not this Newtonian game of billiards where balls roll because they are hit by cues. What we're involved in is a dance where, for example, watch a snake. When a snake swims, there's nothing more beautiful than watching a snake swim in water. Lovely motion. But you see, it wiggles along, and its wiggle is conceivable, you see, as convex, or was it concave? This way, and that way, and this way, and that way. Now, which side of the snake moves first when it wiggles? It's very easy to see there. Now, when we act, interact with the world, what moves first? Who starts it? The objective world or the subjective world? You can't have an object without a subject or a subject without an object. You can't have something known without the knower, and that gives the show away. There isn't any real distinction between the knower and the known. There's two ways of looking at something, yes. Two poles of a single process. But the knower and the known are subsumed as the knowing, and all life is knowing, being, becoming. And uh, it, it isn't something, in other words, that works by the idea of all this happens because someone shoves it. Now, you see, the idea all this happens because someone shoves it is basic to Western thinking. But they are related as this to that.